I think it's instinct. I think that the, probably that uh, that's what's kept them alive for thousands and millions of years, I guess, is that uh, one horse decides to take off and bolt and run the other way and they all go with him. Whether they wanted to or not, just instantly and instinctively, because that's what saved the whole herd, or at least some of them, back in the dinosaur days. When we spread out and gather those horses, uh, it's like they know. Those horses just know. And they know before you even see them. They can hear. I don't know. There's something about a horse. I think they can read our minds. They just know. And you'll see them, you'll see them running two miles off before they've even seen you, just because there's like some hidden in, inner herd communication, and they all just start running. And horses, when you gather them, they don't gather slow. They're not like cows. When you gather horses, it is full on, full on, fast, go. Gathering horses is a little different than driving them. You're in open country, it's kind of like hunting, I guess. You head out across the seven, 8,000 acre pasture and you're on two sides of the canyon and 500 foot cliffs to the bottom of the canyon. It's, it's your job to find all the horses and, and you're starting out lots of country, very few horses. As the day progresses, the bunch gets bigger, headed towards that uh, section of ground down low on the creek. They do run in herds and there are natural leaders within those herds. It's not always the fastest or the smartest horse. Sometimes you'll look at a horse out front and go, why are you here? Why are you in the lead here? But within our group of several hundred horses, there may, there, there may be 10 different little bunches. We call them bunches, you know, because that's what they are. They always hang out together. If you see one of them, you see, you know that that bunch is accounted for. And generally, they stick together by where they go to work in the summer. They become friends just like people, you know, and they hang out in those little bunches. But within, within a big bunch of horses, say, say 400 horses, once they get the idea that we're moving them, we're gathering them, and we're headed in, in one direction, slowly those bunches will start coming in to become bigger bunches. But there's always leaders in those bunches, and that's what you want to watch when you're gathering horses and when you're moving horses are your leaders, because your followers always follow. They've been out on range for six months, and whether they'd like to admit it or not, they, they're they gentle horses, and they're kind of hard to some of them to convince of that. Most of them head in the right direction, and and there's a few outlaws that you got to tune up on a little bit, but most of the time they'll, if you got good cowboys in the right, right spots, you can get them into the pasture that you want them in. pretty good bunch and they're, it may seem like mayhem when they're all running in 16 different directions but it's not they're they're well well trained and well broke horses and they know what they're supposed to do and they'll try and they'll it's more about it's more about conveying to them what you expect of them than it is about about just sheer brute or sheer speed it's you've got to make sure that they know what you want from them. Because usually ten times, nine times out of ten a horse, if he knows what you want from him, he'll do it. This is part of their job, is when to come in. It's time to come to work. And they need to know that. And so it's important that we don't screw up. It's important that we don't mistrain them. This isn't a one-time deal. This is part of their life on our ranch is they go to winter range and they come back again in the in the, in the spring and the, we run them on pastures and to get them home they have to know how to how to be gathered we have 400 head of horses that work um, they go to guest ranches and outfitters and hunters and trail ride outfits and kids camps and out of 400 horses the majority of them have a job and that's how we have a job they work <laughs> the
the majority of our, our clients use our horses to make money for themselves and so they require a specific type of horse. Uh, we, we have what we call show week, which is right at, that's the reason we bring our horses in in the springtime, is so that we can show them to our new clients and start our season, which is really the beginning of our work here for the horses. We show them what we've chosen for them, what we think is right for them, and then they preview them, make sure that they like them. And uh, we know them all. We know all our horses. We know their personalities and their names, and we know them as individuals. So we kind of get in the, our heads what we think is going to work for each each different outfit that takes our horses and then we hope that we were right we try to tailor our horses uh temperament with their people's ability for example uh somebody that has a lot of experience will will give a horse that has a lot of experience and somebody that's never ridden before will give a horse that has never been ridden Keeping our horses broke isn't isn't much of an issue, except for in the spring. And the only way to to remind them that they're broke is to crawl on them and go, and let them do whatever they're going to do. Let them if they want to buck, let them buck. If they want to run off, let them run off. Get it out of their system before their people get here. And usually, and I know who they are. The ones that I know are going to screw up year after year after year. And I got a couple of horses that are twenty some years old and buck every spring. I know that they're probably too old to work very hard when they, if they're 23 or 4 years old and they don't buck anymore, I know there's something wrong. And uh, probably the the uh, uh, horses that, we, we don't buy much underneath 10 years old anymore. They're, they're just, there's not anybody that can, can uh, work a young horse or will forgive him for screwing up for just being a horse. We don't do so much breaking of horses, we do retraining of horses more than anything. And that's the biggest challenge, is keeping your horses, keeping your horses not spoiled and not soured. And they do, they, they learn all kinds of crazy things in, in, at their jobs from people that don't know horses, because that's the nature of the business. You're sending broke horses to people that don't know really how to ride, or, because that, they're, they're dudes, and that's our business, is we cater to them. So it's a special kind of horse, first thing, that'll that'll stay broke and that'll put up with beginners and then it's a it's a program of monitoring you know and you'll get a horse that for three years is perfect and then one year you'll get a report on the fourth year that this horse just hates his job and that's the way we interpret it but he's doing things like kicking other horses and biting and laying his ears back and not wanting to be saddled in the morning and we just know it's time to change his scenery and get him a different kind of job because he's bored. He's just like a person, you know, he's bored. So you just keep him broke by by making him happy with the job. And there are some horses that this isn't right for them. You and you know it too. They don't like it. They don't like dudes. They don't like they don't like it. And you find a different job for them where they can do what they like or else you have a problem. Every year we have a horse drive. Um our we I guess it's been four years now, we got a hell of a pasture over there that's about 35 miles, miles from the home ranch, and it's some of the best grass on top of a mountain, and uh, uh, it stays open all winter, and it's good warm, good warm water, runs through it, and uh, ridges stay blowed off, and it's excellent horse country. And we've got to get those horses from there to home for show week, where we show all these horses to their prospective employers for the summer. and. Uh, there's no way to get them home except truck them or drive them. Well, with 400 head, we're three or four days now getting them trucked, and it's uh, we thought thought that as much interest as we've had in in these horse drives, that we ought to uh, invite the public to go. It takes three days. We start out. We don't uh, we don't babysit anybody. We we they're they're an employee of, for for three days. They work for us. They get a horse from us and. Uh, they aren't, uh, they aren't along just for the ride. We're dependent upon them to, uh, to help us. And by God, they do pretty good. Most of the people we reckon, we, you know, we recommend that uh, they have a lot of riding experience before they come here. They're not gonna have a very good time because this stuff is wide open and there's canyons and cut banks and draws. And, and we're starting out on about 7,000 acres, you know, collect them into a 640 acre pasture and then drive them 30 miles in two days. And 
If you're just learning how to ride, that's not going to be all that enjoyable a trip for you. And we have some people fall off anyway, and we haven't had anybody get too badly hurt, you know, a little lost little hide or something, but uh, that's kind of to be expected, and that's probably going to happen every year. They're going to get on a horse. They're going to be a cowboy. They're not just playing it. They're going to be one for three days. They're going to get their ass chewed just like they would on a real outfit, and I get to do that, and it's as it's hard on me as it is, I'm not opposed to doing it just so they'll get the full experience. I think running horses is the most challenging riding you that I do, I know, uh, and that maybe you can do. And it's fun. It's fun. It's like a good sport. I guess maybe a lack of self-preservation <laughs> is the best kind of personality to have if you're going to move horses. Because I can't stand to lose. I was born to be a cowboy Full of dreams and broken bones God, it ain't an easy life But it's the one I chose And I was born to be a champion Not every horse can gather horses. And so when people call us up and they say, can we bring our own horses? We always say no. Because you can't just if you run several hundred head of horses underneath most horses' noses, they are going to flip out. They are going to get in that bunch and run away too. That's not something that most, most horses today know about. They don't know about running in big bunches of horses. So if you are an excellent rider and you've got a horse that hangs out in a 20-acre pasture for its life with one other horse, Though you probably are 100% confident on that horse riding in any situation, you get him in the middle of another couple hundred head of horses, and that's not the same horse, and they don't always act like they're supposed to. So we use our horses because our horses know this life, and our saddle horses know their job. I was born to be a cowboy Full of dreams and broken bones It ain't an easy life but it's a one I, I don't want to create any illusion here that this is an easy deal. If, if you want a watered-down package version of the Old West, this isn't it. We recommend everybody comes in here who's got a little bit of riding experience and some physical stamina because it's three days of pretty hard riding, and it's not the same as a, as a walking trail ride in Yellowstone Park. This is, this is going to be at least trotting and sometimes wide open running across some pretty damn rough terrain. This isn't flat. This is Montana. There's rocks, there's cliffs, there's draws, there's everything. And your horse is going to see a damn sight more than you are for a little while. And if you're not ready to make that turn when he is, guess who's going in the dirt? We thought that our guests would be interested in some Montana bowling, Pogriba style. That's Larry's last name. Yeah, it's just, it's just black powder. The first year we had this pasture, I was riding around fixing fence, come upon a bowling ball and go a little further. and. There'd be another one. What the hell is going on? Met our neighbor Larry. I now well, know. Let's see this. Got such small holes. I may not be able to. Is there any danger I going up when it hits a gunpowder? What are you easing in there? <laughs> well, look out, boys. There we go. They claim Larry's kind of got a short fuse. You want to watch him a little? Okay. So this one, we're just gonna go for this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got contact. Well, from the moment our guests arrive on our place, it, it, they're part of the crew, and it's a small group that we have here, so we don't have a huge amount of people. You will know your cowboys, your friends, and they will be part of your, you know, your crew. So once we arrive, um, and we're out on that gather. We're out in, basically in the middle of nowhere. We've got. Um, we have put together a weekend that is just chock full of really, really good food, excellent company, uh, lots of really good entertainment. First night we stay out in wall tents and hope that it's not freezing, but if it is, we've got big bonfires, we cook big juicy steaks, sit around the campfire and have some cocktails, and we've got a couple of local musicians that, that ride with us and, and a cowboy poet, and we just all kind of hang out in front of the fire that night and eat and drink until we fall asleep and next morning we don't want to stay up too late.
Excellent entertainment. It's all about cowboys and horses. The whole weekend, it's about cowboys and horses, and it's not made up. It's real. The real cowboys and real horses, and the real cowboys are singing, and the real cowboys are around the campfire, and, and you probably have some ash in your coffee, but that's the way it is, because that's really the way it is. <laughs> I was in kind of a bad deal, tried to get out of a bad deal, and it ended up being a bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was having a bit of a problem of late in the ways of getting myself a date, so I decided that I'd indulge in the latest of fads. So I rode, in, <clears throat> I rode into town and got me a form, and I wrote out all my glory and charm, and I sent this little description to the personal ad. It said, single white cowboy, six foot one, 200 pounds, and lots of fun. Cute as a puppy and handy in the shoots. I won't wear nothing but Wrangler boots. <laughs> no, just in boots. <laughs> well, I got a curly one on Mr. Norris. I kicked over your chair. Yeah, he's That's screwed up. Won't wear nothing but just in boots. I wear Wrangler jeans, two Copenhagen snuff. I drink Coors Light beer, and I'm pretty tough. But I'm gentle as a kitten. I say please and thanks, drive a brand new Ford and got money in the bank. I rode pro rodeo last five years, saddle bronc, barebacks, bulls, and steers. I cover my head with Stetson hats. I like old blue healers and I'm fond of cats. I keep a neat house and I will settle down and come next year, I'm finals bound. Well, that's what I wrote, but, well, it didn't take long till I was figured out. <laughs> and that first date realized I'd lied about my qualifications when it came to the cowboy way. So she shamed me into redoing my ad, and though to read it, it makes me sad, I went back and wrote what my ad should really say. He said, divorce twice and lonely. I can't keep a wife. I couldn't ride a horse to save my life. I never rode bulls, never roped calves, and as far as that money, I've spent both halves. I'm kind of scraggly looking, drive a beat up truck. I usually roll into town on fumes and luck. I wear a beat up hand me down Mexican hat. I don't own no dogs and I hate cats. <laughs> I'm about five foot ten and 300 pounds. I can't own a horse because I live in town. I drink old Milwaukee. I ain't that tough. I got sick one time when I tried to chew snuff. <laughs> my manners escaped me and my house is a pig pen. And hell, just like last year, I'll be watching the finals on ESPN. <laughs> I used to think that uh, horses were stupid, but uh, I think they're a hell of a lot. So I think they can read your mind. I can't prove it, but we'll be sorting horses or something, and uh, we'll have... And these horses will have never worked together. We'll have two, three hundred head of horses in the corral. And these horses will have never worked together. And we'll sort them off from their summer jobs to where they're going to go. And we'll be just sitting there talking about it. Renee will have a horse list about which horses go to which place and which ones we're going to send to a place. Never work together. And we'll look down the alley, and there'll be four or five of them horses that are on that sheet of ten that will already be standing together. Can't explain it, but there is a psychology there. And, and a, or a, I don't know, maybe they know more than we do and they're just letting us get away with it. A guest ranch will call me and say, all of our horses are junk. And they'll be the same horses they had the year before. So what we've started doing is we say, all right, you uh, don't know anything about horses yourselves and usually the guest ranch owners don't. So I say, all right, make every Wrangler ride every horse. And you'll find that the same guy will have the same problems with every one of them. And usually the one that'll get along with the horses the best will be some little girl. And that's just because she likes them, and those horses know it. 1965, uh, 64, my dad didn't own a horse, and he went to Grand Teton Lodge Company in uh, Wyoming, just south of Yellowstone in uh, Teton National Park. He uh, showed him the math on how much it was costing them to own their horses as opposed to what it would cost them to just lease them for the summer. Remember, he didn't own any yet. This was in the winter that he went up there, and he talked him into renting horses, and uh, he got a loan, and he went to buying horses and breaking them. Of course, back then, they had some guys that could ride a few, wranglers that were working at the ranch, 
and uh, I, I don't remember how big the first contract was. I think it was 60 or 100 head or something like that, but it was a substantial amount of horses. But uh, that's how he got started, and uh, I was raised in this business. My granddad homesteaded in, in Colorado in 1918, and he, right in the bottom of a canyon, he raised five kids just exactly like it was the 1800s. He never learned to drive till he was 50 years old. And he raised his kids just about as rough as you can raise them. They all knew how to ride, they all knew how to rope, and they knew how to do about everything. And they, they were bronc riders and ropers, and, and there wasn't nothing they couldn't do a horseback when they come out of there. Those kids scattered out of there, and, and when they were raised as poor as they were, they knew they wasn't gonna stay that deal. So my uncle started ra uh, renting horses in Colorado in the 50s, late 50s and he teamed up with my aunt and his, her husband. And then my dad learned a little bit from them. He went to Wyoming and done the same thing. And uh, now we're in uh, Montana and we're leasing horses. So I guess the next generation will be in Canada. The sweet smell of rain on her Sunday plains with a good horse between my knees. There's a hole between me and me and Dad there, and you're the guy blocking it. And the horses is coming this way. You'll want to be on that side of it. It's just kind of academic, I think. You mean don't step into the gate. Stay out. Well, get over there like like where Scott's at, and then kind of then that way you can push them horses over before they ever get to the hole. You don't have to just stand there waiting for something to happen to you. You can make it happen before it actually becomes an emergency situation. Uh, the next morning, then, we pull our horses out of, out of that holding pasture, and that's about 600 acres, that pasture, and we start trailing them home. We start, you know, in, in the back country, and then come up the gravel roads and, and through the fields and uh, end up going through the town of Willow Creek and then down the highway and through the town of Three Forks. And that's the straightest shot and that's the best way. That's the old Yellowstone Trail. All you see is in this plain. You dread the sound of thunder. There's no shelter from the rain. Uh, we have a core, our core of cowboys that we still, that still trail those horses and help us trail those horses home. But on a big drive like that, you need more people. You need more people to fill the holes and make sure that, you know, the gates are closed and and big open country like that, you need, you just need that many people to move that many horses across big open country. So we started asking guests to, to come along. And we, it's been great. They have had, they have been invaluable, invaluable. We couldn't have done it. We cannot bring them home without help like that. And it's fun. It's fun. And it's, a, it's amazing to me to see some of these people, you know it's an adrenaline rush. You just know it is because some of these people are riding in country they've never seen before. They're riding horses they don't know, and most of them ride well, thank goodness, because if you don't, you know, there's some hidden dangers, I suppose, in running that many horses across that kind of country at that kind of speed, but they, they do good. And then the night the stars came out, Horses are bred to run. That's their. That's how they got away from the dinosaurs. They they ran, and any whenever it doesn't matter if they're happy they run. Or something goes wrong they run. It doesn't matter. Whatever happens, a horse wants to run. And so, what you'll see on our drives is there'll be. This is an exaggeration, but 50 cowboys in the front and one in the back because the horse is just trying to run over the people in the front. Now they're looking for any, they're, they're trying to get from a controlled situation to an uncontrolled situation. They want to run. So an open gate alongside the, the road, for instance, has got to be plugged by a cowboy and a horse. And if they screw that up, the lead is now changed from over here to this open hole. And it changed instantly. There's, there's, there's no time, there's no, and, and so that guy screwed up. So now we may have another hour ahead of us and maybe some cut horses. Because if horses see some horses getting away over here, and if the fence isn't all that good, the ones that are up there, they're going to say, piss on the fence, and down they'll go. And they'll, once they've started across a fence, they'll all go through it. They all go through it.
as a cowboy on when you're trailing them home. Your job is to keep them in a bunch um, and basically block any, any escape. Keep them moving at the right pace, not over the top. You want to keep them contained. And, and basically, you're just right, there are cowboys on every side of your bunch, sides, front, back. And, and as a rider, you've got to, just because you're not in the front doesn't mean that you can't, you got, in fact, the sides when you're in that big open country or when you're in that, that nasty closed in, fenced in, cattle guards, you know, houses, that kind of country, on the sides, that's almost more important. In fact, I think it is more important because one horse screws up and heads the wrong direction and you, you lost them all. You lost them all. And then what do you do? You know, they're in the church's backyard or worse yet, out on the highway. Or, so I guess your job is to keep them all in a bunch, keep them moving in the right direction, and keep them safe. That's the big thing. Keep yourself and your horses safe. And there's obstacles everywhere that'll cut a horse up. I'm gonna put the best riders in the front. When I say you get to go to the lead, that means that you're, you're a good hand and, and that you've earned the right to get up there in the front and that I'm dependent on you. It's got nothing to do with social status. It's just about, it's a matter of, of whether I can trust you or not. If I put you into a gate, I know when I put you into that hole that you're going to turn the horses and keep them from killing themselves or getting away from us. And somebody comes along the outside and replaces that guy, he comes back to the front. So it's a constant cycle from front to back. And that'll be happening on both sides of the horse drive. You just have to be able to think quickly and be Think quickly, be very observant. You have to watch not only what you're doing, what your horses are doing, but what every other guy in your bunch is doing. You cannot be out there for yourself. You have to work as a team. So you have to, but you have to be able to think independently too, to see where you need to be so that you can make the whole the whole bunch work. And um, be very, very, very bold. Be gutsy. Be tough, and you have to be able to make quick decisions and act on the decision that you just made half a second ago without having to analyze it or ask, is this what I need to do? You just need to do it. And we try to get everybody to the lead of this horse drive at least once. And uh, I try to have people that want a safety up. If I see somebody safety up all the time, I'll go get them and I'll bring them to the lead. And, those people will be the, the happiest for, for doing that and actually accomplishing something of anybody. They'll be the drunkest one at the bar telling the wildest stories that night. And I don't think that you can duplicate that anywhere else. Cattle drives just aren't the same. Horse drive is, is something that you have to experience. Riders, they say, well, I've been on cattle drives before. and. By God, you just can't explain that. It's something you've got to experience. It's not at all the same. It's, it's about 10 times the pace and about 10 times the adrenaline. And there are damn few people get hurt on a cattle drive. We, a horse drive, there's always somebody going to lose a little hide. Guaranteed. On a cattle drive, all of the riders are, are, are in the back of the herd because they've got to be prodding the cattle along. With horses, you don't have to do that. Horses are going to try to, they're, they're always trying to run off. They're always trying to do that. And so if you've got 10 cowboys and 100 head of horses, you'll have eight cowboys in the lead or on the sides and two in the back. And on a cattle drive, it'd be just the opposite. You might not have anybody in the lead. You'll have all your guys on the sides and in the back kind of keeping that thing moving because you're pushing them. The horses are, you're, you're, you're holding them back. Otherwise, the, the ones that are in the front, they'd run and they'd run wide open if you let them. It's your job in the front end to keep that somewhat to kind of resemble control. Kale says that um, our job is, is creating the illusion that everything is under control. And I guess that's kind of true. It is like creating the illusion that everything is under control, but not really creating an illusion. It's like really trying to maintain control of that many different minds. 
I think the coolest thing that happened is when we brought those horses through Three Forks for the first time, there were there were quite a few people watching the horses go through, and lots of lots of um, um, spectators and cars and flashing lights and baseball players and all kinds of just all kinds of mayhem that these horses had to go through. And these horses had kind of been lollygagging off, you know, they've trailed out over the last 14, 15 miles, and they're starting to line out. And we hit town, and we hit town at a trot after a wreck or two, but. We hit town at a trot, and I looked back, and I saw all those horses had sucked in together. They were all lined out in the middle of the line, and they were looking, going, where the hell are we? Because this is not Kansas anymore. They all sucked right into a bunch, and they followed us right into that pasture. They did the right thing. They were, they were, <laughs> they were not going to screw up downtown. They didn't want to end up in somebody's backyard. They, they just all lined right out, and they were part of us. It was good. <laughs> Then that night we stay in Three Forks, which is great fun. It's like, um, I heard stories about Three Forks, how they used to send their, um, their naughty teenage boys back in the turn of the century time to go out and learn hard work and, and from the cities, they used to send them to Three Forks to learn hard work and, and labor in a, a good way of life. And the guys just, you know, ripped up the town. And instead of learning how to be good cowboys, they learned how to party, I guess, is what they did, but I kind of think of those old days, you know, when we stay at that old hotel. Stinky shaps and and dirty, dirty, smelly cowboys, we'd stumble into that ho old hotel and I'm listen to the fiddlers and whoop it up and eat really good food. Eric and, and Elaine Kelly at Me Austin Ryer. All right. Our core group is, we kind of stick together and we kind of want to because we're having our whole old little world going on. The whole town turns out for this thing. The whole town and all the neighboring towns come in to Three Forks to see the horses come through. They go to the show, uh, to the Red Steagle show with us, and then we kind of all split back off again, uh, have some really good dinner, and um, that night we have uh, Sid Strummy and his cowboy swing band play, and we just dance the night away. I think they were up till two, three o'clock in the morning. Hardwood floors out in the middle Someday of the Sacramento Hotel. It's a great time. I might change my restless wandering Change all my ways But for now I gotta move along To another place Another town
traveling most all my life. I've known a lot of women, but I never took a wife. But for some, it's just our way. I met a cowboy. That's how I got involved in the Gone horse business. Tomorrow. And uh, I really was just a horse crazy girl. When everybody in high school and junior high had pictures of boys on their wall, I had pictures of horses on mine. And I think girls, especially at a certain age, and horses kind of tend to go together. There are a lot of really horse crazy girls in this world. So who would have thought that years later I would actually get that dream? Because there was a zillion dreams in between my original dream of doing what I am doing today and actually doing what I am doing today. And those dreams that I had in between didn't happen, but the real original one did, and it, I think that's pretty cool. I don't think that I could have dreamed a better life for myself. I did dream it. And I met Kale out of college on my way to law school. Um, God thank him for saving me, I guess, because I live a life now where I hear horses every day, I see horses every day. I, I live that dream life that I thought was really cool, and it is kind of cool. I don't think there's anything better than in the morning waking up and hearing horses walking outside my, my door, or hearing them in the night whinny back and forth to one another, or knowing them and having them come up to you when you're walking out there. and they've, There's just something pretty neat about that. They trust you completely. They are expecting you to do the right thing. And you, in turn, expect them to do the right thing. And it's a pretty good relationship when that works out. And if you really love horses, and there's a difference. A lot of people think they love horses, and they don't. They don't like them, even. But if you really love horses, you just can't imagine living life without them in it. It's a little different when you're not raised in it. I see Mickey and Kale and Dar and Lonnie and the Mantles, you know, and they're, they were just born with that knowledge. They were raised in it. And it's a little different when you're an adult and you have to learn it. When you have, you, your body doesn't work that way. You know, your, your instincts don't work that way. You have to learn that. And as an adult, that's, that's difficult, I think. You don't, you're not born with the ability to know that many horses in that kind of an environment. We're going home today. No, we went through three or four fences there yesterday right before town, but I don't think we'll have that today. The baseball diamond is probably what got us yesterday, the softball. The softball guys made a home run just as we was coming through town and losing that bell went off all at the same time, so if I had the horse, I wouldn't know any. 24 riders. I think we've got, what, 30? 17 on horseback. 20, 25, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I heard 39. Maybe 45 riders. North Carolina, we've got some Phoenix, Arizona, San Francisco, Montana. We're taking 300 and some odd horses to our home in Tree Park. About 350 to 400. I heard 360. 350 to 400. I don't know. <laughs> 350, 360. Between 350 and 400. 350, 360. 360. Could get a little western. I want about four guys in the back again. You'll all be listening to Barb. Whatever she tells you, do that. You want to keep that back end a little tighter today, but I don't want you running over the front. That's going to be a fine line. She'll tell you whether or not you're going too fast or too slow. If you lose one horse, You've lost everything. Abandon whatever you were doing and try to get around the lead because the lead will change from the front to the back like it did yesterday in a matter of seconds. That's when you get crazy and start squalling and hollering and try to keep them going the right way. If they run over you, then we've got a horse race try to get to the front. The riders along the side are going to keep pushing the horses into the center on that open road. There'll be no fences on this side. There'll be no fences on that side. That means that we're going to have riders, probably 10 on each side, keeping the horses at center. It's going to resemble a flying wedge as we go. Just keep pushing horses behind. If you got horses behind you out here, you've already lost. Get around them. A couple things. We're going to cross these guardrails up here. We have got to have these horses inside the guardrails before we get there. Or if they get on the outside of the guardrails, they are about that thin and the horses can't get back. They're going to try to jump it and they'll cut a leg off. 
we need probably two, three riders that are aggressive with whips to keep them pointed on both sets of those guardrails. I want Bill, Mel, and Butch. I want you guys on those guardrail crossings. That's three. I need one more guy. Bar or uh, Jeannie. Christy, I want you in the lead. Where you at? Anything, Lonnie? Well, the thing I can say is, uh, when we cross, we get them going good, and we get to cross that interstate, we don't want to crowd them too close. If we hit them too hard behind, and we're going to knock a horse over the top of that on top of a car coming down that interstate. Guys, Mark, you're on top of that. Back off. Let them horses string out. And then the, you know where the Madison crossing is on the front of the road? There's another one just like it there. All right, lead men, come over here so I can see who I got on my team here. Pavement is great for cars, ain't worth a damn for horseshoes, it's slick. And you can't make the turns and, and be as aggressive as you could before because your horses don't have the stability under their feet as that they had before. The, uh, uh, our shod horses have got toed and heeled shoes on all of our saddle horses. That helps a little. Our western horseman guy, uh, his horse actually lost his footing there in town at Three Forks and down he went and spilled him out like a can of beans right out in front of God and everybody right on the yellow line in the town of Three Forks. And he rides real well. So it can happen to anybody. You know, you got to be someplace and you're not thinking about anything and try to turn your old horse and down you go. Cars and people and stuff like that, they, they don't really have that much effect on our horses by the time they get there. If they were all standing right outside the pasture, our horses might be a little reluctant to go out the gate, but uh, by the time we get to town, usually we've got them under control and they're, they're kind of understanding the program again. A guy should go out, or a woman should go out and try to do something that scares them a little bit every day. And uh, with this horse drive, I think that we we allow people to do that. We allow them to to accomplish things they didn't think were even possible. Some people that are that are, are almost deathly afraid of horses. At the, at the beginning of this last trip, we made them come to the lead and and accomplish some things they didn't think they could do. And uh, I think that that uh, by doing that. It'll help them in other parts of their life too. And I don't know whether it's adrenaline or by by doing something that you're deathly afraid of, I think you you get a satisfaction that nobody can take away from you. I don't believe I, I don't think that you I, I don't you can't this you can't fake this. This is something that uh, it's it's personal, it's individual, it's something that you know whether you did it or not. You know whether you stayed in the back and played it safe or whether you went to the front and actually made a difference. I don't believe that anybody can fake that, nor do I think you can describe it. You can say what you want, anywhere in the world about your riding abilities and all that but when you get here it ain't gonna take but about three seconds to, to get through it and everybody's gonna know and it don't make any difference I mean it's the more truthful that you are about about what you can and can't do will probably allow you to have a lot better time on this day. girl that was that was on this that was probably a little uh, a little less experienced than than I would uh, recommend coming on this ride but uh, we got her to the lead and uh, she started out pretty meek and we let her ride for two days towards the back of the herd at just a kind of a trot and on the third day I went and got her and I uh, told her that she had to do she wasn't gonna go with me she pretty much locked up on me, I wasn't going to come to the front. And uh, the rest of the group had the horses under control so I could go back and pick on people and I don't, 
necessarily I'm not opposed to that. So I went and got her, and uh, I said, all right, Shannon. I didn't have to grab her lead rope and make her go, but I said, all right, Shannon, fall in behind me here. Let's go. And she goes, I can't. I said, yeah, you can. Let's go. You got to do something every day that scares you. So she followed in behind me, and we got her out in front. And uh, she was so damn sore she couldn't even walk, let alone ride. And uh, by God, she didn't, after about 10, 10, 15 minutes, she had it. And she's still emailing us. This has been six months since it happened. She's still emailing us, thanking us for uh, that opportunity to find something in herself that she didn't know was there. And that's guts. And she's damn proud of herself for doing it. So that's what we want everyone to take away from this outfit is a sense of accomplishment. The bat guy is important because he can he can control the direction of the back of the herd, but the front the front of the herd is where it's all determined. One horse can screw up and outrun a lead, and you will lose 400 horses because they just naturally are herd bound. They naturally want to be together, and they naturally run together, and they naturally follow the front. They follow the lead. So the best your best hands are going to be the guys that can control the lead that aren't afraid to run at 65 miles an hour horseback on you know slick ice because they got outrun the lead we don't find that the thoroughbreds are as good as the quarter horses for for people that haven't done this before predominantly because thoroughbreds are, are bred to run and sometimes they don't stop you can pull on their head and there's nobody home <laughs> pretty when they're running away, then they're right in the middle of the horse herd with the horses, and that takes away a lot of the, their experience. I got a horse that's special. It's a no-brain, no-pain deal. You can't hurt him. He's, I bought him at the horse sale in, Bill, in Bozeman, and I, the guy that owned the sale barn come up and he was apologetic to me that I'd got the horse. And I got him home and, and he's perfect. There's not another application for this horse. He's a runaway. That's all he is. But by God, we don't have another horse that can outrun him. And uh, he's perfect for this job and he loves it. He's uh, buddied up with my, my wife Renee's horse, Amber, and they're almost inseparable now. You gotta trust your horse. If you trust your horse, then you can get it done. And it's it's less dangerous if you're not fighting your horse because your horse knows what he's doing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be riding him on our drive. And if you trust your horse, you can you, you take a lot of the danger out of it. But it's dangerous. Every, somebody gets hurt. It happens. It does. It happens. You are riding breakneck over some country that probably is better that you're not riding breakneck over, but you've got to be there. You have to be there, and you don't even think about it. You don't even think about your riding. You don't think about, you don't think about what, how you look. You don't think about what the other guys are thinking, because once you're in the middle of it and you're moving that many horses, you are thinking about your job. And if you're not, I hope to hell you're not there, because you're not doing us any good. I think it's kind of cool that the horses that we use to gather, they know they're, they know they're something. They, they act like they're different than the other horses. They know that they're the cool horses. They, they're the work horses. They're the staff. <laughs> For just a moment, they're not just horses. <laughs> Horses tend to follow other horses. So if you lose your horses in the middle of in the middle of the side, a side a side of the bunch, and you changed your lead, all the horses that were in the lead up front, with what you hope are your pretty good cowboys controlling the front, are now turning around and following those other horses. So you are the lone soldier out there in the front. And you know sometimes it doesn't work that smoothly. Sometimes the lead changes and. It's not 400 horses or 800 horses or 1,000 horses that all follow in one bunch. Suddenly, you've just split your herd in two or even three. 
And if you're lucky, you've got one crew that's good enough to handle all of your horses in one bunch. I don't know of a time when we've had a crew good enough. Ever. I don't know if there is such a thing. Once you set your crew up, you set it up for that many horses. And if you've got suddenly six different bunches of horses headed in six different directions, basically you may as well get, sit and have a cup of coffee and wait for everybody to, you know, find out where they're going to be 20 miles from there. Because you're, there's nothing you can do. If, they, if you lose them, you're done. You're done. I've heard stories. Now, we've not had this happen. I'm sure we will. I've heard stories about the lead getting away. And I'm sure it wasn't always the lead, the front of where you headed direction. Sometimes they spill out the side or something. And people actually have to load up their horses in trucks and trailers to outrun them so that they can unload and get in front of them again and turn them back the way they need to go. If you lose your lead or you lose your prime, and by losing your prime, I mean your lead turns around, your horses turn around and go back to that pasture that they're comfortable in because you weren't moving them fast enough, you weren't ke keeping them moving, then you're, that's, that's, that's what you're trying to prevent. You're trying to keep them all moving in the right direction. But that lead will change easy, fast, especially when you don't have any lanes. Especially, when, you know, if they get real spread out, there's the possibility for any number of different directions for them to turn and for them to move. And that can be bad. His ride is over, I'll dig smoke is great. High on that hill where the blue bumps wait. So he'll be remembered, I ride with my hand. This song about Smokey, this cowpuncher's friend. I mean, they had more fun, and so did we. And it's all work. I mean, it's, it's hard work. The, these people from South Carolina, North Carolina, Phoenix, everybody, they had a great time, and I think probably they had more fun because we did depend on them, and they learned how to do it. We make sure that every one of them is terrified at least once on the trip. And I think that adrenaline is probably, why. and it don't matter, their social status, whether it's their bankers or lawyers or veterinarians, it don't matter. Once they get on a horse, however, ride, however well they ride a horse, that's how well they do their job. And, and, and you can't fake that. By three days, these people, whether they, they didn't matter where they came from, they did exactly. And I challenge you to find a, a bunch of cowboys that could, in the last part of their horse drive, could drive 400 head of horses down an open field and not have any runaways in any direction. They all learned how. They learned how to do it and they did it well. I was sitting around town, I was wasting my time. Out of a nickel, not a making a dime. Fella steps up and he says, I suppose you're a bronc rider from the looks of your clothes. Now he guesses me right and a good one I claim. Don't happen to have any wild ones to tame A good one I've got and he's got lots of buck And unseaten top riders he's had lots of luck I get all excited, I ask what he pays See me ride this caballo a couple of days Showed me a ten and I said I'm your man For I've never seen a pony this cowhand can't fan Never Never drew a breath that I couldn't ride him till he star plumbed to death. Says, get your rig, soon get your chance. We got in the buckboard, we drove to the ranch, and I stayed there till morning. But just after Chuck went out to see how this old crow bait could buck. Went round the bunkhouse and standing there alone in the corner of the corral was his strawberry roan. He had a little pig eye. Big Roman nose, little pin ears, and big pigeon toes. Had a long drawn tail and a long lower jaw. I could tell with one eye he's a regular outlaw. First came the blinds, had an awful fight. Then came the saddle, a century down tight. Jumped in his middle and jerked off the blinds. Just sitting there waiting for him to unwind. Surely unwound Seemed like he quit living down there on the ground Went up in the east and came down in the west Me in his middle of doing my best Then first went my stirrups and then went my hat Left me grabbing leather just blind as a bat and All of a sudden he made a high dive Left me a-sitting 
way up in the sky And just in a moment I bounced back to her Laying there cussing the day of his birth Yeah, there's one still a-living, there's one still alive One still a-breathing that I cannot ride But there's no man living, no man alive Can hang a strawberry wrong when he makes that high dive chicken cried and the little chicken make and the little chicken laid me a hard boiled egg oh turkey in the straw ha 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 turkey in the hay hey 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 roll him up pat him down any way at all play a little tune you call the turkey in the straw you don't have a choice once you've lived this life because there is no substitute for it. You, you can't go back. 